spiritual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. At about 10 o'clock at night on the 29th of September 1969, the farming towns of Tulbach, Woolsley and Ceres in South Africa experienced the most destructive earthquake in South African history. Many homes were destroyed and 12 people were killed. Thousands were left homeless and landslides ignited bushfires and the aftershocks continued and could be felt for several months. The Ceres Tulbach earthquake measured 6.3 on the Richter scale. This was the strongest earthquake to ever shake South Africa since measurements began around 1900. I was only six years old at the time, and we lived barely 120 kilometers away in the suburbs of Cape Town. I recall very little of the event except waking up and seeing my mother standing in the doorway of my room looking terrified and telling me that everything was all right and it was just an earthquake. The Bible speaks of great earthquakes during the end times. At the end of the last podcast, episode 39 of Journey Through the Scriptures, I ended somewhat abruptly at verse 12 of chapter 11 of Revelation. I focused on the fact that the worst that anyone can do to believers is to put them to death. After that, Jesus declares in Matthew 10 verses 28, there is nothing more they can do. It is the destiny of everyone who believes in Jesus that if we die, we shall be resurrected and shall ascend into heaven to be with the Lord Jesus forever. This is also the destiny of the two faithful witnesses that appear in chapter 11 of Revelation. In verse 13 of that chapter, in a display of his power and judgment, God shakes Jerusalem with a devastating earthquake when he resurrects and snatches his two witnesses away into heaven. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. God never lets sin go unchecked. Many times he prolongs judgment, but at other times he judges sin immediately. In the case of the unbelieving world's treatment of his witnesses and their subsequent celebration after their murder, God's judgment falls immediately. This earthquake levels one-tenth of Jerusalem and immediately snuffs out the lives of 7,000 people. Remember that an earthquake rattled Jerusalem when Jesus died on the cross. Matthew 27 verses 51 tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. There are other passages in the prophets that predict the same formidable earthquake mentioned in Revelation 11. In Zechariah 14 there is a prophecy containing the return of the Messiah. At that time, he will stand upon the Mount of Olives, and when his feet touch the mountain, it will separate in half. Half will move to the north and half to the south, creating a great valley between. Modern Jerusalem currently has a population of close to a million people, so, no doubt, you can imagine what a massive earthquake would do to the city. What is described in this passage is a literal earthquake. I say this because one of the largest geological fault lines on earth runs just to the east of Jerusalem, right down the Jordan River Valley. This fault line is part of the Great Rift Valley that runs from eastern Lebanon down to Mozambique, and this is the boundary between the African Plate to the west and the Arabian Plate to the east. This is the great geological fracture that divides the African continent from Asia. A major earthquake occurred near Jerusalem in 760 BC, during the reign of Jeroboam II. This earthquake is mentioned in the first chapter of the book of Amos. Scientists have estimated that the magnitude of this earthquake might have been as high as 7.8 on the Richter scale. These same geological forces that shook the earth during the time of Amos the prophet will one day produce the earthquake that John describes in Revelation 11. In Revelation 11 verses 15 to 17, the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet, which is the final blast of the trumpet series of judgments. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. 
this close-up view of the Great Tribulation draws to a close and a new phase of God's program comes into view in Revelation 11, verses 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. By now you will have guessed that we have seen these sights and sounds twice before. They mark the end of the tribulation period and the beginning of the millennium. The twenty-four elders proclaim the beginning of the reign of Christ on earth. They worship him because he has taken his great power and begun to reign on the earth for a period of a thousand years, as chapter 20 of this book will soon tell us plainly. If you look closely at verse 18 of Revelation 11, you will see that it is a condensed view of the tribulation and the whole millennium period. It first begins with the anger and the rebellion of the nations, where it says, The nations raged, but your wrath came. This echoes the words of Psalm 2 verses 1 to 3 that say, Why do the nations rage, and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. This describes the great rebellion of the last days. Remember the reaction of the remainder of mankind on the earth in Revelation 9 verses 20 to 21 after the blowing of the sixth trumpet? The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And how will God answer the anger and rebellion of the nations? The twenty-four elders before the throne of God give us the answer in verse 18. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. We can learn from other scriptures that the dead are raised at the beginning of the tribulation period. Paul describes it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he describes the rapture or the removal of the church. Paul says here, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. However, at the end of the thousand-year reign of the millennium, there is another raising of the dead. This time, the wicked dead will be raised to stand before the great white throne judgment. We will come to that later in the book. Throughout this whole period, the servants of God are being rewarded. Here we must take a picture out of the book of Matthew 25 verses 31 to 32 and insert it into the picture of Revelation like a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Here Jesus will judge the professing believers of that time, those who claim to be Christians. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. What is the basis of His judgment? It is how people react to the helpless, the hopeless, and the homeless and he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. 
Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for the one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In this section that we have just read, what does Jesus mean when he talks about separating the sheep from the goats? He is really prophesying about the coming judgment of those who claim to be believers and followers of Christ. Some, the sheep, are genuine in their profession of Christ. Others, the goats, have made a profession with their mouths that have not been matched by the life they have led or the inner condition of their hearts. This judgment of professing believers occurs at the beginning of the millennium. It is a judgment of the living who survive the tribulation. Yet again, we see how John's prophetic vision of the future has powerful application in our own lives today. The way we live our lives right now reveals the true state of our hearts. On that day, some time in the future, some will be found among the sheep and some among the goats. Their deeds will tell the story. Let us return briefly to verse 19. Here we are told that God's temple in heaven is opened and the Ark of the Covenant is seen there. The Ark of the Covenant was a chest made of acacia wood, overlaid with pure gold. It was not very large, only 1.3 meters long and just over 0.8 meters high and wide. It contained the original tablets of the Ten Commandments, which God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, along with the pot of manna and the staff of Aaron. It was decorated with gold statues of two angels on either side of the mercy seat of God. It was here that the high priest, only once a year, entered the Holy of Holies where the ark was kept and atoned for his sins and the sins of the Israelites. The priests sprinkled blood of a sacrificed animal onto the mercy seat to appease the wrath and anger of God for past sins committed. This was the only place in the world where this atonement could take place. The ark was carried by the Jews during their forty years of wandering in the wilderness and it occupied the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later in the great temple of Solomon. The ark disappeared into the mists of history during the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 587 BC. There are many theories as to what happened to the ark. Some people say it was destroyed, while others think it was looted by the Babylonians, while others believe it was hidden by the Jewish people before the destruction of the temple. But actually, the ark of gold which occupied the Holy of Holies in the time of Moses, King David, and King Solomon was a copy, a representation of the true ark that stood in heaven as a sign of God's promise to Israel. The ark that John sees in heaven is not a copy, but the true ark of the covenant that has been safely kept there in heaven as a guarantee that God has not forgotten his people Israel. The ark of the covenant always relates to the nation of Israel, and chapters 12 to 14 will focus again on Israel. For the third time we shall retrace these last three and a half years of the tribulation until we come again to the lightnings, the rumblings, the peals of thunder and great earthquake and hailstorm when the seven bowls of wrath are poured out in chapters 15 and 16. This repetition is something like driving on a circular drive like we have here in the Neisner forests. The beginning and the end are one and each time you do the circuit you will notice some more detail that you missed in the previous circuit. In the same way, God has given us a wonderful privilege to be able to read the last chapters of the history of the earth. We can read ahead and see where it is all going to end. The time is coming, this book teaches us, when Jesus shall reign over all the earth. Righteousness shall be the characteristic of the times, not unrighteousness as it is now. In the beautiful words of scripture in Isaiah 11 verses 9 and Habakkuk 2 verses 14, we can see the promises God has for us. Isaiah says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And Habakkuk says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. History is not just flopping along randomly like a piece of paper in the breeze. 
history is moving inexorably forward with every detail formed fully and executed in the mind of God. History is moving specifically down this path, with a crescendo of very precise events described in this book of Revelation. The message of the seventh trumpet that everyone in this world needs to hear is that the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign and He reigns and He is going to become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign. He is the one who has the right to rule the earth and someday He is going to take it back. There is coming a moment when that happens and it will be a moment of final judgment. People talk as if the world is going to go on the way it is going forever. People act as if God does not matter, as if Christ does not matter. But the word of God is crystal clear about what is going to happen. The Apostle Peter said it so well in his second letter, chapter 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 40. Episode 40.